This is a Thinking of Playing video on Napoleonic Battles, Austerlitz 1805. Um, I have set up in, entirely the historical scenario. Um, I, I set it up very quickly. Um, what I mean by that is that in most, actually I think in all cases, you're given three, four, or even five different hexes, I'm sorry, areas, in which you can set up um, your units, each of your units. So, so, so in that sense, you're in effect really given again three, four, or five area zones for each um, for each group of units. Um, maybe corresponding very, very roughly to a division. Um, yeah, so in that sense, I very quickly set this up. Um, I imagine there might be some fun in giving, you know, your initial army deployment a lot more consideration than I did here. Um, uh, this is the French army over here. Basically, they're oriented um, that way. Uh, this is the, the, uh, allied army, the Russian and Austrians are set up here and two things right away, probably the only, uh, battlefield landmark that is immediately recognizable is the Pratzen Heights. This, uh, this, um, land mass here. Um, the other thing that's recognizable even from setup is how, if you consider that I have Kutuzov back here, this is Kutuzov back here, um, next to the village of Austerlitz here, you can see how the allied left is extended forward. Um, I mean, you can see that. Okay. Having set up the historical scenario, initial impressions. Um, my initial impression is this is really confusing. Um, the pieces are very colorful. Um, the pieces are very colorful and the map is very, very indistinct. Um, you can't say it's muted. You can't say it's plain. It's, it's neither of those things. And yet it's not, it's not very clear. It's not, uh, uh, it's not, so far, initial impression, initial impression is the map is not very, um, uh, well, basically helpful. Now, I will say one thing, the strange <laughs> pattern, <laughs> the strange coloration and the strange texturing I will say probably the only, um, uh, the only, the only thing I'll give the game, the only thing I'll give the map look is that, I mean, I guess it was early December, so it's certainly not going to look bright and green and, uh, and shiny. Okay. Um, so the bottom line is kind of has kind of has a vague cold wintry look, but even that isn't very, uh, even that isn't very effective, but still I know it would, it would, it wouldn't be evocative at all of the uh, historical battle if it were bright green and, um, 
again look like the middle of summer. Okay, so uh, first set up like this. Second initial impression is I'm not at all sure what to do. It's not obvious what to do uh, at all. And I don't mean in a tactical sense. I mean, I mean simply in a rule sense. So I'll, I'm just going to step through a bit here and um, try to get a feel for how the whole um, flow of the simulation game goes. Um, oh, and again, here is the this is, this is going to be interesting. I think, like on my first or second step into the sequence of play, I'm going to have to be able, I'm going to have to be able to quickly figure out um, who's who, who belongs to who. And so, because, like from this angle, it's impossible to tell who is who and who goes to who, who's subordinate to who. Um, I was thinking that the way this is looking, I mean, I have the order of, well, the setup card, well, wait a minute. Yeah. The, uh, I mean, you have order of battle cards. And I guess that I'm thinking it's pretty much essential that if you don't already have, like I knew going in that the allied order of battle was, uh, was poor. And why was it poor? Because it was really imbalanced. Um, and I knew that they had probably too many subordinate formations. There was, a, I think, a split command, and the components were, were imbalanced. I had that idea going in. But anyways, if you don't have an idea going in of what the orders of battle look like, I mean, I, I knew Davu was commanded the Third Corps, and I, knew, and I knew going into this game generally where he was on the battlefield. Um, so anyways, I had a little... I had a, an idea, but I think going into a game like this, you should really have a good idea of both army orders of battle. Um, and if you don't, you can study these cards and these, it would probably be worthwhile to study these before you even start, because I think I'm going to probably be referencing them a lot anyways. Um, so I'm probably going to study them again, get a, a sense uh, of the overall orders of battle. And then I think like literally when I go down to figuring out, you know, can this, uh, can this artillery unit right here, can this artillery unit, I'm sorry, can this cavalry unit, I can see even from here, it's a cavalry unit. Can this cavalry unit move now? Is this cavalry unit activated now? Um, I think there's going to be a lot of that and it's going to be, okay, so who's who, who is it? Who does he fall under? Um, so who's active, who's not active. Um, now that I'm looking at everything set up, they probably, I mean, I imagine probably the best thing in a design sense, although I'm not, I'm not saying anything isn't playable at all. I'm, I still think that this is going to be perfectly playable. Probably the best thing would be if you were looking at, and by the way, this is almost the entire map. There's only, off of the screen here, there's only one more row of areas. And you're actually looking over there. That is the top row of areas right there. And you have, looks like just one, just one more row off that way. And that is, that right there is, the very edge of the map on that side. So you're, you're looking at 95% of the map here, which by the way, the, my third initial impression is, wow. Um, when I studied Austerlitz many, many, many years ago, I had a much bigger 
much bigger view of the battlefield in my mind. Um, this, you're not getting any, uh, not getting any edges. <laughs> this is, this is really cropped in, okay? But hey, just play the game as is, so, but this is very cropped. I've never thought of the Austerlitz battlefield as being this, this cropped. But anyways, um, it's very, it, third impression is it's very uh, crammed. So that's going to be interesting. Um, okay. The best design idea would be if you were up um, like three, not three feet, about two and a half feet away from the map like I'm looking now. If it could have been possible, well, I'm sure, I'm sure it could have been possible to have, I mean, the national, uh, I'm sorry, let me back. The, the graphics that are suggestive of national standards are great. And of course, they did do the coloring, but the coloring isn't very well, doesn't help you at this at this distance. They could have easily had a solid, I don't know, a solid uh, uh and they could have had a solid uh band, a solid band going across the entire front of the entire front of the pieces about that. You know, we're talking half a, you know, a half a centimeter, maybe even half a centimeter wide solid band. And, and when I say solid band, I mean, not a watermark, not a background. Um, but I mean a solid band of a solid color, primary color, or in, in other, uh, either a primary color or a very distinctive color. So uh, for all the units, for every single um, formation. And then when you're looking at it from this scale or this distance, you could have, uh, you could tell, uh, where each formation was, even from a, a distance. But it's, uh, that's just a comment. Um, I'm going to go with, and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to use what they provided, which is the, uh, which is the, the color coding here, like the red. No, this is the red. This is the red formation. So units there. What is the red red formation? I go to the French order of battle. I look for the red formation, light blue, gray, green, red. Red fourth core, uh, Sult's core. So is that correct? Yes, it is. Yes. This is Le Grand um, Division. There he is. Infantry Division, Le Grand, part of Sult's Core, Sult's fourth core red. So it worked. It worked. And so far that's always worked. So, um, that's what I'm going to go with. So, but that's going to mean being more like <laughs> a foot or less, uh, from the map. All right. So let's see how we actually get going with the sequ with the sequence of play. For the sequence of play, uh, phase one is weather. Phase two is reinforcement, and phase three is command. So here, uh, both players are going to determine the command status of all units. Unless a scenario says otherwise, um, on the first turn, all units and leaders are automatically considered to be in command. Using that first turn uh, rule, um, first turn command rule, uh, I don't think there's anything to do for uh, phase three command on this first turn. I'm going to go to uh, phase four, chain of events. Players determine which player is the first player for this turn. Now I'm going to go ahead and determine first player according to the series rules. As I, just for this thinking of playing exercise, um, I'm not going to be considering any of the Austerlitz battle-specific 
rules or considerations. I'm just taking the units on the map and use the series rules to, to, to exercise the series rules. Uh, when I go to an actual see it played series, uh, that will use the Austerlitz battle uh, specific rules. So uh, we're going to determine um, first player. Uh, each side is going to roll a, a die, add the army commander's initiative to the roll. Player with the higher total chooses which player will go first to activate his or her formations. So this is not an, a mandatory thing. Is If you win the initiative, you get to say who goes first. Um, and I want to note that Napoleon... Napoleon, Napoleon, where is Napoleon? Uh, there he is. Napoleon's initiative is five and Kutuzov's um, initiative is five. So we have a, you know, a battle with two army commanders of equal initiative. So let's see who will go first. So Kutuzov wins the, the initiative die roll. Um, and the Russian side is going to take the first uh, formation activation phase, primarily because Kutuzov wants to get more forces onto the north northern part of the Pratsen Heights here. He's got units down here, but there's kind of a bald spot here. So with that in mind, uh, that's what uh, that's what Kutuzov is going to try to do first. So Kutuzov rolls a four. He subtracts that die roll from his initiative five for one. So for this action phase, he can activate one formation. Um, so what is a formation? Formation is anything under a formation leader. And so far I have seen no um, discrepancies. Basically you have Kutuzov army commander all of his immediate subordinates are formation leaders and and each of those sub, uh, subordinate leaders oh, actually that's confusing underneath Kutuzov are formation leaders a formation leader may have subordinate leaders but um, I think if you are starting cold um, I'm going to look at the Allied Order of Battle, and I'm going to say each of these, I'll skip the Army Headquarters for now, but there's the Russian Imperial Guard under Constantine, the yellow for formation, so this is all a formation. There's the center, or fourth column, the red formation under Kolorov. There's the left-wing blue formation under Buxhauden, Bux Bux uh, the right wing, the white formation under Bagration, and the fifth column, the green formation under Liechtenstein. So of these five, which one would I want to act with first? And I think this is Kolodov uh, with the center here, closest to filling that bald spot I, I mentioned. So I think I'll go ahead and uh, the first Formation activation is going to be Kolodov with the center. And so Kolodov's center is going to go through the first action phase, which is also phase uh, six of the sequence of play. So going right down the steps of an action phase, you have cat cavalry charges. We're not going to do that yet. We're not set up to do a cavalry charge yet with the center. Uh, next is the artillery segment. Uh, I don't have any artillery that can bombard. Although this, of course, is when I want to... This is exactly when I'm going to be looking closely because I looked at this artillery unit here in Area 059 on the Pratsen Heights. He's in the adjacent area to Kolodov, but is he part of the center? He's not. I, I actually... You know, I reflexively looked to the tiny writing on it, but I actually could have... Now I'm about a, f a little more than a foot away. I can clearly see it's a, the blue formation, so I'm looking for red. Red is the center uh, formation. And let me let me check something that might help me out. Okay, so this is not hugely obvious, but 
I'm pointing this out because, you know, there have been... Um, now skip that commentary. I think you just have well, to at least help yourself. You want to figure out what tools are available to you before getting before getting frustrated. Um, I did notice when I was looking at Kolodoth here that he does have this red stripe behind his leader values. So that's what I want to look. And then I looked over here at uh, Liechtenstein. And yep, look at that. Liechtenstein has a green stripe behind his leader values. And when you look back at the Order of Battle card, again, well, I said it once, I'll say it again. Kolodoth is the red formation. Liechtenstein commands the green formation. And so you do have that. It's not, again, it's not, it's not huge, but I can see it from here. So, um... So that also can help uh, remind me of what I'm looking. Well, look at that. Well, look. See, see, this is why. This is exactly why I do this. I haven't spent any more time looking at this. I haven't spent any more time looking at this than I've recorded. Um, and I just noticed now that. Yep. I just noticed now that the infantry units have their center lines are the formation color. They're not, yeah, so, so the yellow formation, well, no, it's not yellow. Is it yellow, gold, whatever you want to call it. But it's the same, yes, it's the color behind their step level, as I said before. It's also the color of the name, which, okay, this could be small for, for a lot of people, but it's also the color of the background stripe, the center line. So really there are multiple, there are multiple little color cues on the, see, see, uh, Kolodoth's infantry here, red formation, red center line, red unit name, red triangle behind the step level. So actually, I guess, when you when you attune your eyes to this, there are the little cues here to help you. Okay, so even if you know nothing about army organization, you're looking for the red guys. Red, red, uh, red, red, red. Um, these are not red. So yeah, so actually the red Kolodoth's formation is. You know, um, uh, concentrated right here. Just as another check, I went through from the order of battle card. I went through each, each uh, subordinate uh, for Kolodoth's center of or fourth column, and it uh, it corresponds just right. Three infantry. You have Austrian artillery, and you have Russian artillery. So it all. It all works out. So actually, if I can start tuning my my eyes to that, I can see the formation. So these guys are active. Okay, so the artillery now. So now I know Kolodoth's artillery is back here on the far side of the Protzen Heights. They don't have any enemy to see or fire at. We go on to uh, step or segment C of the action phase. That's movement. So we're going to move these guys, get them as far forward as we can. Okay, from the very beginning, if I want to move this infantry unit with Kolodoth leader unit as far forward as possible, how do I even get started? First of all, the leader has a movement allowance of four. The infantry unit has a movement allowance of two. So we know we have two movement points to spend. So what terrain are we in? Look at the area. It's a squarish area in this case. This, of course, is clear. Um, this behind here is considered slope. Now, slope has no movement point cost. But this is, is, is a separate terrain type called a rise. 
So this is a slope, so clear, slope, and rise. Clear has no added movement point cost, slope has no added movement cost, but a rise has plus one movement point cost. So when you have multiple train types in one area, which on an area map like this, we're going to be dealing with this a lot, I assume, you're only taking the highest cost. You're only taking the cost of the most expensive train type in that area. The same principle applies to boundary train. So for movement cost purposes, we can call this a rise area. Now it's specific. Now the rule, the train effects chart, which is on the back of the rules book, clearly says that there is no added cost for exiting a rise. So this is a rise area to a slope area. I assume that this is a slope area. I assume that this is not treated as clear. I could wind up being wrong about that, but I assume this is slope. But there is no added added cost for slope. So this is one and this is two. So they move two slope areas, uh, which is the maximum allowance of the infantry uh, the infantry uh, unit. The leader went with them. And by the way, at this point, I think, I have to orient, it does, the leader doesn't matter, the leader counter doesn't matter. But the, but the long unit, when I'm done moving here, I have to orient uh, the long unit. Okay, I've, I put the unit and leader back. Um, this is a redo. I'll be honest and say I have no idea why this matters. <laughs> but the rules specifically say that I can reorient the infantry division before it moves or after it moves, but not both. Again, I have no idea why that's going to play in anything. So, but that's fine. I'll go, so I'm not changing its facing. I'm going one without change in facing, two, no change in facing. Oops, I guess I changed a tiny bit there. Okay, and then now I'm going to orient the piece. So I think, so again, the leader doesn't, matter at all. His placing doesn't matter at all. What I'm going to do is I'm choosing to orient. So now I'm done moving. Now I can orient facing. What I'm going to do is I am going to try to figure out the best way to do this. Actually, I think yeah, I actually think it's best to orient the piece this way, and then I'll explain why. I think this is the best. See, the leader doesn't matter. I'm just putting the leader here. Doesn't matter where the leader counter is. It matters where all the long counters are exactly. So I'm done with my movement. I moved to, and now we'll talk about facing. So the line, the center line running through the, the, the infantry division defines front flanks and rear. So areas that are wholly forward of the line are, fr are front hexes. Areas. You see, I keep saying hexes. You know I mean areas. So area 102 also has the village of uh, Blazovitz, is a, is a front area to the infantry division. So this is front, and this is front with the French division. Oops. See, this is why you can't move those... Uh, can't move the infantry divisions. Okay, again, for the infantry division, area 102 is entirely forward of his center line. So this is a front area, and 079 is a front area that has the French division there. Um, area, the area, I think it's 76, uh, here is a flank area. For the infantry division. Area 81 is a flank area and area 59 is a rear area. So again the line defines front flank and rear areas for that infantry division and so he's done moving. The reason why I oriented the division that way and I pulled him back because the unit you can move the unit anywhere within that area 
as long as he's physically inside the area. The reason why I pulled him back to make area 102 a front area is because the infantry, the French infantry division here could, because he's got a boundary there, I'm thinking that the French division could attack Blazovitz, take out the Russian artillery here, and then if I had if I had just left the, the unit like facing, for example, if I had left it just in the center of the area facing the French, the moment the French division took this area, then the French unit would be on the flank of, of the, the um, Austrian infantry division. So that's specifically why I decided to pull him back and orient him in such a way that, uh, and see, he's in, he is entirely inside the area, and he's oriented so that 102 and 79 are front uh, areas for him. As I move the rest of the center here, I just want to point out real quickly that uh, when the next infantry division, uh, remember with a movement allowance of two, entered the, the, this area, most expensive terrain in the area is the rise, which is plus one. So this is cost two movement points, which is all of the infantry divisions movement allowance. So it's not moving anymore. Note that the, the artillery is not stacked on top of the infantry. This artillery, because it's not stacked on top is unattached. This artillery is not attached to the infantry unit. If it were attached, it would go on top and, and there are uh, substantial rules differences for attached and unattached artillery, but for movement purposes, if the artillery is attached to the infantry, the unit now has a movement allowance of one. Now, of course, you can always move one area, so it wouldn't make a difference, but I still wanted to show when they're separate, one, the artillery is unattached, and so you, you pay attention to all the rules for unattached artillery, and also, in this case, the infantry has a move, movement allowance of two, and the unattached artillery has a movement allowance of two, they spent two to enter the rise. And now I'll continue with the center, rest of the uh, center there. So I got an infantry division with a, uh, the, the leader up forward on the edge of the uh, Pratsen Heights. The rest of the uh, column is following here. Um, that's the it for the movement uh, step of this activation phase for the, for the uh, allied center. Um, so we go to the fourth step, or step D, uh, which is assault. Now, the infantry division is adjacent to an opposing unit now. I, I believe, I don't know of any reason why they couldn't launch an assault, but they're not going to do so now because they're going to try to strength, strengthen the Allied center here first before they launch an attack. But strictly speaking, I don't see why they could not launch an assault now. These are one hour turns. So they moved forward to the edge of the Pratsen Heights and then they could, if they wanted to, assault the French uh, division there. The rules note that you wanna uh, indicate um, that all of these leaders, that all the leaders of this formation, now this formation only has one leader, but um, all the leaders of this formation are done for this, for this turn. I'm going to go ahead and mark the, uh, mark the leaders, and you only have to mark the leaders because of the strict um, chain of command through an order of battle. So I'm just going to put a marker on Kolodov showing that he's done, and that means everybody under him is done for this turn. So now the other side uh, uh, rolls to activate headquarters or formations. Um, Napoleon rolled a three. Napoleon also has an initiative of five. You subtract the die roll of three from his initiative five for two. So uh, Napoleon will be activating two formations. In general, I think the idea is Napoleon, right? I keep losing him. Napoleon, oh, oh, yeah, he's off the screen here. Um, Napoleon is going to uh, advance with his center towards the Pratsen Heights. So again, he's gonna get two formations. So uh, we'll move. Now the big thing is there's this stream. This is the Goldbach stream. So here's the Pratsen Heights. This is Napoleon back here, as well as the very French center. 
Um, this is the Goldbach stream that goes all the way uh, across the battlefield, and the French are predominantly on this side of the Bold Goldbach. So to, to, to advance towards the Pratzen Heights, you're going to get two formations heading that way, and a lot of them are going to have to cross the Goldbach. So the Goldbach is two extra movement points for artillery, plus one for all others. All right, so I'm getting into some assault right away. Um, the uh, Sultz Corps, or well, the Red Formation, um, yeah, Sultz Corps, um, the uh, artillery moved, or the cavalry moved up here, the infantry crossed the Goldbach here and oriented so that this area and this area are both to the unit's front, and actually area 36 is to the front as well. So area 55 is flank, area 35 is a flank, and these three areas are fronts, are front areas for the infantry division there. Here, moved forward, some artillery, the leader, infantry division. I oriented in such a way here so that area 79 is a flank area because it has a friendly division there, and so that this area with the Russian cap to Russian light cavalry units is in the front of the infantry division there. Of course, I had to choose. I had to choose to orient, orient this way or choose to orient this way, which wouldn't make any sense. So because of the very odd, long, rectangular shape of this area, I didn't have much of a choice, but I was able to just barely put this area to the front of the infantry division. Now, I think I have this right, even though it looks a little odd. The units oriented like this, Area 74 is still in the front. Here's the boundary. So even though the units located here, it's still attacking or across, assaulting across one boundary to a frontal area. Okay, now we're going to see what happens. I think the, the French Light Cavalry is just going to try to... Um, Retreat before combat up here. Um, we'll see how that works. So this wasn't good for the Russians at all. Um, to retreat before combat, they have to pass each individual light cavalry unit here has to pass uh, a morale check against the area morale. Now, since these are two small units, no long units, we take the average of their morales. The morale of this unit is five, the morale of this unit is three. That's the second number. On the bottom. So five and three averages four. So each has to pass a morale check by rolling four or less on a six sided die. The first unit failed and the second unit succeed. And also, if you decide to retreat from before combat, all light cavalry have to try. You can't try to retreat some and not others. So basically, a bad situation <laughs> resulted because. The, the stronger, higher morale unit retreated successfully, and the weaker, lower morale unit is left. So this unit is going to have to survive uh, assault from the infantry division. Now, it is across a stream, so that's going to reduce the infantry division strength by 25%. Okay, for assault going in, in uh, each step, uh, strength of the infantry division is six. So we start with six dice. We adjust for terrain. Attacking across the stream is going to reduce it by 25%. That's 1.5. Uh, so, uh, so that would go down to 4.5 and we round down uh, to four. Now, now we're gonna adjust for morale superiority. The French division has a very high morale of seven. The Russian light cavalry has a, a low morale of three. We're gonna take the difference, seven minus three for four, and we're adding that number of dice. So that's pretty significant. Now we're gonna add two more dice for the tactical rating of Soult. Soult has a tactical rating of two, initiative of four. 
So we're adding two for his tactical rating. Okay, even though this is uh, just an infantry division attacking, assaulting across a stream, a Russian light cavalry unit is probably going to be a, a massacre only because the French infantry division has more than twice, um, more than twice the morale of the defender. French morale of seven, defender's morale of three. So that means that we are uh, hitting on fives and sixes. Ten dice hitting on fives or sixes. So the, the French rolled all these dice, got four hits on the Russian cavalry, which is going to eliminate it. But assault is always simultaneous. So the um, Russian light cavalry still uh, returns fire. Now, cavalry that attack or defend in the assault phase have their combat strengths reduced by 50%. So they start with a strength of two, have that to one, um, and I think that's it. And only hitting on a six, the Russians rolled a four, so they did not get even a single hit. So once each side has figured out how many hits they've caused, then we, then we apply hits. And in this case, I think the light infantry unit Light, uh, light cavalry, Russian light cavalry is wiped out.